Welcome to Real Vision. It's Wednesday, December 4th, 2020, just after market close in New York. This is the Real Vision Daily Briefing. I'm Ash Bennington, joined shortly by Real Vision Managing Editor, Ed Harrison. But first, with the day's stories, Jack Farley. Thanks, Ash. Blessed if it does, blessed if it doesn't. That seems to be the destiny of the U.S. equity market. Let me explain. The non-farm payrolls uh, data came in today. The U.S. added 245,000 jobs, and that sounds good, but it's the smallest monthly growth we've seen since March by far, the smallest since January, actually, and it's also well below the median estimate of 460,000. In fact, of the 78 economists surveyed in the Bloomberg median estimate I just mentioned, only six of them had forecasts that were below the actual number of 245,000. The labor force participation rate dipped from 61.7% to 61.5%. And that means that 656,000 Americans in aggregate exited the labor market over the last month. This means that the ominous square root figure of the labor market that many have been talking about, including Ed, is continuing to take shape. Lastly, it remains the fact that every single industry, and I mean every single industry in the US, employs fewer workers than it did one year ago. The data released today suggests that the damage to the U.S. labor market will endure and that the economic scarring will last long after this horrible virus has been overcome. And what did the equity market do on this bad news? Well, if you thought that it would plummet, you were wrong because U.S. equities were actually up today with all three indices making minor advances. The bond market concurred with treasuries selling off as investors exited safe assets in order to jump into that sweet pool of equity risk. The spread between 30-year and 5-year treasuries reached a 4-year high of 130 basis points, as long bonds felt the greatest pain today. In fact, the 30-minute move in the 10-year today was the biggest we've seen since uh, AP called the U.S. presidential race for Joe Biden on November 7th. The narrative that's making the rounds today is that these negative uh, data prints in the U.S. labor market are actually good for stocks and for risk assets because they motivate Congress to pass a stimulus bill, as well as for the Federal Reserve to extend their emergency lending programs. Um, and there actually is some evidence to support this. We've seen that fiscal and monetary authorities uh, this year have been extremely responsive to the labor market. And you know, with their interventions, they have buoyed uh, risk assets. So that, that is one argument, and it does make sense. But there's another argument that you know, the reason stocks went up today is because uh, we're in a period of unbridled bullishness. It's not so much that bad news is good news. It's that all news is good news. Before I flip it back to Ash and Ed, I wanted to mention that Lynn Alden and Hugh Hendry had a dialogue today about the euro dollar and international trade. Definitely check that out if you get a chance. Uh, I might also mention that Lynn Alden wrote a very detailed article um, expressing her views in greater depth. Um, so I'll definitely check that out and I'll leave a link to that um, in the description below. Uh, with that, let's go back to Ash. Thanks, Jack. Welcome, Ed. Thank you. You know, oh, you know what I just noticed, uh, by the way, while you were talking before, is that your lower third, it said, it didn't say, have your name, they had it misspelled. It said Cash Pennington. <laughs> I don't know if you saw that. That would be like the perfect uh, name for a finance writer. It would be, in fact. Uh, and uh, and <laughs> I, have to, I have to stop here because it's too funny. It is going to say Cash Pennington, by the way. I, I got them to put that as the lower third. <laughs> That's fantastic. Just so that you know. So, you know, actually, I have the story behind that, uh, by the way, in terms of uh, Cash Pennington is, is that I was talking to you the other day. And every yeah. time I, I think of the name Ash, Ashley, I think about Ashley Cole, the great um, halfback, or I think he was a right back from uh, Chelsea and uh, Arsenal. Uh, sorry, not Tottenham. And, uh, you know, when he switched from Lo the London side, Arsenal to the London side, Chelsea, people called him Cashley uh, 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 Cole because he was all about the money. That's why he was making the switch. So Cash Pennington, uh, you know, Cashley Cole, there's some uh, there's some rhyming going on there, and I'm clearly all about the money. Why else would someone leave banking to come to journalism? <laughs> and I was going to say Happy Jobs Day to you, but maybe the better uh, greeting would be Not So Happy Jobs Day. 
No, not at all. You know, I think you were going to tee it up. There was the the chart that that says it all. What is it that um, a picture um, is like a thousand words or something like that? Yeah. This chart is totally like that. Uh, it's uh, I got it from the uh, New York Times. Maybe we can put that up there on the screen. It's a cumulative change in jobs since before the pandemic. And I think that, you know, we were running about 152 million jobs in the economy in February. And of course, that fell off a cliff. But, uh, you know, we slowly have worked our way back. The way that we worked our way back, though, tells a lot from my perspective. It tells you where we are in this cycle, how this cycle has been going. What do you see when you see that chart, Ash? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's you teed it up beautifully, right? Let's go through the numbers really quick and we'll come to it. Look, 245,000 non-payroll jobs added. Uh, that's off 638,000 prior. Uh, so that's below the consensus at 500,000 uh, and uh, and at the very bottom of the consensus range. That number that we got today is 38% uh, of the prior month's number of October's job creation number, or put differently, it's 2.6 times higher last time than this time, you know, we saw a slight decline in the unemployment rate from six uh, to six point seven percent from six point nine percent. But that's on a declining LFPR. That's the labor force participation rate, which dropped from sixty one point seven percent to sixty one point five percent. And talking about charts, Ed, you know, my one chart says it all for today. It's something that you've been talking about now for months, which is this inverse or reverse radical sign recovery. If you look at this chart, this is really striking. It looks as though um, you, you reverse engineered it to look like uh, the uh, the reverse radical sign that we've been talking about. But this is, in fact, that the civilian labor force participation rate that we've been talking about, uh, civ part on the St. Louis Fed Fred database. It is an incredibly ugly chart, and it really tees up very nicely all the things that you've been talking about now for months. Yeah. So uh, it's not good. Um, you know, when I look at this chart about the cumulative change of the jobs numbers before the pandemic, uh, the, the the number that you're talking about, the 245 number, uh, is at the bottom of a range that's sort of swooping across uh, in, in a way that is almost like it, if you drew a um, a line through all of those numbers, it would not touch the the, the previous line ever. You know, it's actually going like this in a way like that. I mean, maybe it goes like this and then over a period of five years, it, it drifts off upward. But there's no way that you get to a nirvana with 245,000. I mean, it's a relatively big number in normal cycles. But right. in today's cycle, you know, given that we're still 9.8 million uh, jobs short of uh, February, 2020, 245. I mean, that's not a whole lot. Yeah, rewind it back. Take a look at the job destruction that occurred uh, in February, March, April. Uh, we're not getting back to uh, to where we were, and that's the reverse radical sign. And you know, once again, to pick up on something that you mentioned, Ed, the consensus range here: 200,000 to 610,000, a massively wide range, showing a huge dispersion uh, of of views among economists. And we came in at the very bottom. Yeah, the interesting bit is, you know, when I looked at the numbers, the one that stood out for me, interestingly, was civilian non-institutional population. That's how many people are eligible to actually have jobs where adults. And the number went up a million between November of last year and this year. So if you think to yourself, OK, I'm looking at these numbers here and we are 9.8 million short of where we were in February. But actually, the population's growing over time. You know, it's right. growing by a million. So it's not that you actually have to get back to square one. You have to go even further. So right. if you divide a million people added to the labor force each year or to the civilian population, not necessarily the labor force, it depends on whether they are you know, in the labor force, then you get 80,000 jobs that you need to create every single month 83,333 to be exact, uh, to, to keep up with just uh, the rate of growth of the economy. So that's uh, that's a lot of jobs. And so what it's telling you is, is that we're, we've only created 160,000 extra jobs uh, this particular quarter over just 
you know, pure population growth uh, this particular month. So not good, not good at all. Yeah, that's a really incredibly important point. It's like the target is moving higher every month uh, organically uh, just because of the growth of the uh, of the potential civilian labor force. I believe these are folks who are uh, who are basically uh, who are non institutionalized uh, and not active duty military service personnel. So it's a really broad measure of that potential labor force population. Yeah. So what do we do with this data? Because on the back of it. Uh, when I, you know, when I looked at the data as it came out this morning, uh, markets were doing really well. The bulls were definitely in control. They weren't in control just uh, in terms of the equity market, but uh, everything was up. Uh, gold was up. Uh, interest rates were up. Uh, crude oil was up. Bitcoin was up. Equities were up. So across the board, the bulls are looking through these numbers and they're seeing a vaccine and its wide distribution on the other side and saying that it doesn't matter. I, it doesn't matter that this number was 200,000 light. Uh, we're, we're looking through this and we're thinking about the future. Yeah. You know, this picks up on another point that we talk about on Real Vision Daily Briefing all the time, which is the notion of time frames. And I'm curious to think, uh, hear your thoughts, rather, uh, on what the expectations are for how far into the future markets are looking and how they're making that discounting function. Yeah, I, I don't think of markets as being that prescient per se. I think of markets as being uh, bullish or bearish based upon um, the sentiment at the time the liquidity that's been injected, et cetera, you know, the narratives that are playing out uh, uh, and they just uh, they create uh, momentum and then they go forward. So I'm just looking at the numbers. You know, the Dow was up 248 points, uh, eight tenths of a percent, S&P up nine tenths of a percent. That's a pretty good day for a um, uh, a day in which you you were down, you were light by 200,000 on the non-farm payrolls. And the headline here on investing.com is the Dow hits record uh, above 30,000. I don't know where your Dow 30,000 hat is, by the way, Ash, uh, as bulls feast on stimulus hopes. So basically uh, what's happening is, is, is that there are hopes of stimulus. That's the narrative that's being spun. That's not necessarily how much the market is discounting one way or the other. So I think what's really going to happen is that the market has a narrative. It's spinning that narrative at that time based upon the sentiment. And then incoming data changes that narrative. Uh, and at some point, if the data are so dramatic in one direction or the other, th it spins up a, a completely different viewpoint uh, in terms of the market. So we haven't reached that point in terms of negative, the, the long, hard, cold winter, whatever you want to call it. But uh, there may come a point in wh at which uh, point there's just too much negative uh, numbers in terms of the COVID crisis and its effect on the economy for people to overlook it. Yeah. And I should say, to pick up on that point, uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average closing at 30,218 uh, and S&P 500 closing at 36.99 today, uh, just below the 37 handle, and a 52-week high, meaning this isn't just a post-crisis high. This is a high uh, going back uh, to 2019. Nice. Yeah. So, I mean, who would have thought that, you know, 275,000 people dead, you know, millions infected by a virus would mean new highs in, in the markets? Uh, the fundamentalist in me says it's all bullshit. Meaning, I don't I don't buy it for a second. I'm I'm not I'm not a momentum kind of guy. Uh, right. I believe in in the real thing, and there's no way that you can have an, a, a backdrop, an economic backdrop like the one that we've had, irrespective of how much stimulus gets applied, and say that that's one that's bullish for the for the economy and therefore bullish for shares, and they should go higher. The market is not trading on actual fundamentals. It's trading on sentiment, it's trading on momentum, uh, trading on liquidity. Uh, and that can that can go on for a very long time, but eventually yeah. it's going to trade on fundamentals. Yeah, so much there. Absolutely right. It can go on for a long time. It can remain irrational for a long time. And this is clearly based on sentiment and, as you point out, also the liquidity component. You know, when we talk about these numbers, 
you know, I don't want to give sort of too much credence to it because it's always possible that you can get an unusual calculation. You can get a weird number for whatever reason. We saw that at the beginning of the crisis uh, when some of the metrics weren't being calculated properly. But, you know, if you just step back and you take a look at the big picture, this is the seventh month in a row where we've seen deceleration of job growth. This is, once again, we've said it here before, death by the second derivative. So, I mean, what do you make of this, by the way, the fact that, to me, it was pretty much an unabashedly negative number. It, was, it wasn't terrible, let's put it that way. Remember, 245,000 jobs being created in the year, say, 2017, that would have been a pretty good number, right? But when you're you're short, as many jobs as we're short, it's not really that great a number. How, what do you make of the fact that the market is rallying so much uh, on the back of a number like that? Yeah, you know, two points. Uh, it is, a, it is, a, it would be a great number uh, if we hadn't had massive job destruction, uh, you know, in the six month or eight months prior to this. Uh, but it's it's kind of like um, you know someone uh, gives you five hundred dollars, it's great, but they owe you ten grand, right? It's this idea that you have this massive gap, uh, and we get so focused on the flow variables that sometimes we don't pay attention to the stock variable. And the stock variable in this point, metaphorically, uh, is the idea that you have this huge gap in jobs that were just massively destroyed. And as you point out, uh, even when things remain even, uh, if the civilian labor force, uh, if the population is growing, uh, then the civilian labor force is growing. You need to create additional jobs. I think you did the calculation and you said it was around 83,000 uh, a month. That's just to stay flat. Uh, so these numbers, uh, while they sound on a headline basis impressive, um, you know, it, it's really, it's really pretty, it's really filling in that hole at an incredibly slow rate. But to get to the second part of your question, what do I make of it? I mean, I think it's precisely what you said earlier. This is about sentiment. This is about understanding or pricing or repricing uh, U.S. equities, which are seen as this forward-looking act. After all, what what valuations are stock markets based on? Uh, it's the it's the future cash flows. You're pricing future cash flows, and for some reason, we see this perception. Uh, on a sentiment basis, that investors think that other investors think that those prices are going higher. It's a Keynesian yeah. beauty contest, even though yep. this economy is no beauty. Uh, you know, um, so we've had a decent number of people come on recently who have talked about looking through. Uh, I think Kevin Muir, Jay Pulaski. I think I've also talked to Peter Bookbar about the post, um, um, you know, the post vaccine economy and so forth. I spoke to Gary Schilling today. That's an interview that's going to come out on Monday, or is it next? No, it's on Wednesday. And uh, honestly, he said, yeah, I'm looking through as well, but the, the, the mountain you have to climb before you get there to be able to look through is, amaz is, is immense. And interestingly, just as you, uh, as I was saying that uh, across my screen here, that the U.S. Department of Labor put out an um, a, a, a email, it says, plus 344,000 jobs. You know, so they didn't use the 245 number. They were talking about 344,000 private sector jobs. I mean, people are playing up uh, the numbers, whatever numbers they can. But as Schilling was saying, the, the, you're talking to administer, to, to distribute and administer the vaccine to everyone in uh, developed economies to the point where, you know, people are going to go gangbusters in, in shopping and get that pent up demand in there. Probably a year is what he's saying. So it's a year from now. What happens in that year? The, the, that's the big question. I think that, so when we talk about a long, cold, hard winter, he said, it's not just the winter, Ed, it's the spring and the summer as well. And so when we talk about it from that perspective, what happens? Um, what happens on the stimulus front? What happens on the business formation front? What happens on the uh, jobs front? Uh, there are a lot of things that are going to happen in that year, and some of them are going to be bad on a permanent basis. So I think that the sentiment that we see today, I would, I, I'm, I don't think I'm going to go out on a limb, but this is probably the first time that I've said it uh, as starkly as I do, is excessively bullish. I think that it will decline over time, and there will be a, 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 um, a, a knockback, a, a pullback of a significant measure at some point in time, as people start to realize how much damage is going to be done. Yeah. 
you know, it's interesting. It's we're in this period of just the politicization of facts, right? Reporting different numbers, uh, spinning things in different ways. Uh, you know, on the other side of the coin, to your point about the uh, DOL coming out with different numbers, we had Joe Biden. I saw a few minutes before we get on the air, uh, President Elect Joe Biden uh, calling this jobs report grim. Correct. Well, it, generally speaking, it is grim. I mean, if you look at it, I mean, we can yeah. qualify. We can say 245 is a great number. And as the uh, Department of Labor said, 344 private sector jobs, that's even better. But we were at 600,000 last month, and we were expecting 500,000 this month, and we're still short almost 10 million. That's not a good number. I mean, no matter how you spin it, but hey, more stimulus. Yeah. Another open question. Where are we right now? You know, we're sitting here on December 4th and we're not going to know for another. I, I heard some an analyst uh, on uh, uh, one of the networks say uh, last night, we, we won't know the true r results of the presidential election until December, until January 6th. And the point being that, look, we still the control of the Senate is still very much an open issue. We don't know where we're going to be. Uh, with those, uh, with that stimulus package, we hear some some rumblings now. Obviously, the uh, leadership uh, is going back and forth, but you know, it seems as though the president might be open to signing something. Uh, his his treasury secretary, uh, the uh, the Democrats, it's a lot of moving parts here uh, in a lame duck session. Yeah, and uh, and so um, how would I put this? What what's the best frame to put around it? I think that uh, what I would say is that. Um, well, let's start with this. What do you need? How much money do you need from the government? How much extra spending do they have to give slash taxes do they have to cut in order to make good on what we w should get from the, the real economy in order to justify a, a, a bullish sentiment? So when you say 52-week highs, meaning that today the stock market is higher than it was 52 weeks ago, right. uh, irrespective of, of what the discount rate is, what kind of make good do we need from the government in order to fill up the loss in the private sector to justify that? I think that you're talking probably three, four, five uh, trillion dollars. Um, so we, we've gotten, we, we got the, the first three trillion. Um, do we need more in order to justify that number? It all depends on uh, you know how difficult the uh, the summer is. My general sense is 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 that this is going to be bad enough. Uh, let's use California as an example. They're starting at localized shutdowns that you probably need just to to stay even. Probably another two trillion dollars. So the number is nine hundred and eight billion. That's the package. That's the bipartisan package that's being bandied yeah. around. It's probably too little by half. Uh, and at some point in time, we'll, we're going to see that that's the case, based upon uh, bankruptcies and and things of that nature. Yeah, and that nine hundred eight trillion number that came out yesterday. We were talking about this uh, offline. Uh, 50% of the total stimulus uh, on a quantity, dollar quantity basis that was spent during the entire global financial crisis by the U.S. government in stimulus, in addition to the trillions that have already been spent. Yeah, I mean, the, the, it's a massive hole that we have to, to fill. Uh, and, and unfortunately, it's not, it's not filling at all. So then the question is, uh, once you look at the numbers, uh, how far are you going to get based upon that? Uh, January the 5th was the number that the bogey that you hit. I think that's important because what Mitch McConnell is telling you uh, in terms of how he's dealing with this is, is that he's not going to come to the table in a bipartisan way. That what he's looking to do is he's looking to figure out what Republican priorities are. That's with uh, the president, with Kevin McCarthy in the House. And then he's going to tout that. And, and he hopes that, you know, the lion's share of Republicans will stand behind him, let's say 95 percent, and that that will be enough in order to make sure that whatever Republican priorities are, uh, make th th it stands good. That means that, let's say we get a skinny bill now, then when Joe Biden becomes the president, perhaps if Mitch McConnell owns the Senate, we might not get that much extra stimulus. So I believe that markets are misplacing their 
desire or their their belief that stimulus is coming and there's going to be less stimulus uh, than they believe. J January the 5th is a big date on that. So let's just see whether or not uh, those seats are Republican or Democrat. Yeah. And if we don't get that stimulus, Ed, what's your view? Do we see this uh, irrational mania turn to an irrational depression? Does it flip in a jump function to the downside if they don't get that stimulus? I'm loath to talk about extremes of that nature, but I would say that there will, there will be a reevaluation. Uh, um, and it's hard to say at this juncture what, kind, what that means, because you know, so far what we've seen is, is that the winners are the ones that were already winning, the stay-at-home stocks in particular, were already winning before, the, um, b before we had the, uh, the virus, the Amazons of the world, the FANG, or as Richard Bernstein, who I spoke to, calls it the Fab Five. Um, and the, the losers, they were already losing, the cyclical stocks, the value stocks. So if we're going to be in a long, a hard winter again, it's hard to say whether you can get more winning out of Amazon or out of Apple, out of uh, Google or Netflix. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I spoke with Peter Bookfar uh, earlier this week as well. And uh, one of the things that came up was his expectation uh, about the potential uh, for escalating inflation and rising rates at the long end of the Treasury curve. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that on the back end of this uh, period uh, of the COVID period, once the, um, when the vaccine is fully distributed and people go back to stores, that there is the potential for some rising inflation. There's going to be pent up demand. Maybe you'll have a decent amount of uh, uh, government largesse uh, to go on top of that. And actually, that's probably good for the rotation trade. Not only do you get a rotation in terms of moving away from the fangs, because at the bottom of a cyclical market, uh, cyclicals are depressed, value stocks are depressed, and value stocks, they are banks, and banks need a steeper yield curve in order to win. So yeah. uh, with interest rates going up, as long as they're not going up to 5 and 6%, that could be very positive, both for value and, and for cyclicals. Yeah. The infamous NIMS, the net interest margins that banks basically price the, their, their, their loan book on. Yeah. And, you know, I've seen studies that say that, you know, when you look at the, the sensitivity, it's not, also, it's not just the net interest margin and it's not just the level of interest rates. It's both. So, you know, a steeper yield curve is good, you know, because you have more net interest margin. But at the same time, obviously, yields are higher. If they go up much higher, then that destroys the positive impact for the banks. But if they don't go up higher, there's only a de minimis amount higher. Uh, they can benefit in a very uh, strong way. And on top of that, obviously, you're in a very positive economic environment. So that means that your loan loss reserves are, are minimized as a result of that. And, you know, even if multiples don't expand, uh, you can do well uh, on multiple fronts. So you do well from the net interest margins. You do well in terms of the loan loss reserves. And potentially, you might get some multiple expansion on top of that. So that's a perfect example of value um, getting blown up. The same thing is true also for cyclicals getting blown up. Uh, multiple expansion, earnings uh, growth, all of that is very good. So it was interesting when I spoke to Richard Bernstein about this, just looking through the, the period of, uh, that we're talking about in terms of the pandemic. On the backside of that, the, uh, you could see some major outperformance, some, some significant beats, if you will, because 2020 was depressed. And that's not, not priced in, in his opinion. And so therefore, that rotation makes a lot of sense. For me, the biggest question in terms of book bar, and in terms of Bernstein and what they're saying is, uh, so when does that rotation make the most sense? Uh, we've seen a lot of the rotation in November. I think that if you look at the small cap uh, index, that's the highest increase in a month that we've ever seen, which is higher than anything that we saw in the Dow or the S&P or the NASDAQ in the month of November. Um, are we going to see gains there in December, January, February? Or 
are those gains going to be partially reversed before we get clarity on the end of this particular uh, pandemic? And I think that the answer is some of those gains will probably re be reversed. So I think that November was a buy the, the rumor, and then there's going to be a sell the news, which is going to be bad news. And then the real news, you know, a, a year from now, as Gary Schilling puts it, is going to be in, um, you know, in August, uh, in September time frame. Yeah, it looks like uh, Russell 2000 up about uh, almost 18 percent on the month of November. Yeah, so 18 percent is, is a large number for one particular month. Yeah. It's also going to be interesting, uh, the bank stocks that you talked about. Obviously, the release of loan loss reserves is always incredibly positive for the banks. And also this potential Goldilocks scenario that you're talking about, which is rates moving off the zero bound, uh, but not rapidly uh, accelerating, especially at the long end of the curve, to try and hit that point where the net interest margins increase, but there's not the risk of inflation potentially wiping out those profits on, the, on their loan books. Yeah, and I would think that the Fed uh, would be sensitive to that. They want the uh, the thing to go. So they're going to try to make sure that they cap the long end of the curve in whatever way that they can. And so I think that the likelihood, even in the case of uh, a steepening yield curve and inflation, as Peter was talking about, of uh, yields, you know, spiraling out of control, I think that's limited. More likely they'll go up in, in a, a measured way as opposed to a really abrupt way. Yeah. And it's hard to believe that if you did see a spiraling spike on the long end of the curve, that we wouldn't see some form of YCC. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, we're in unprecedented times because as we were talking about this, I was thinking about 1994, 95. You know, that was the last time, 94, I think it was, maybe it was 93, 94, where the Fed had to, uh, you know, backpedal on uh, an interest rate train that they did. But in that case, it was the Fed that was actually causing uh, the uh, the spike in interest rates. Uh, here, the Fed is going to have to counter the, the rise in interest rates because of what's happening in the real economy. So it's hard to say, you know, how that all plays out from a policy perspective. But, you know, YCC is certainly one thing that's in their arsenal. But at a minimum, I don't think that they're going to move very aggressively to uh, to allow, they will not allow it to continue on. Rather, yeah. So, Ed, with all that said, what are you going to be watching next week uh, in terms of confirming this hypothesis? Yeah. So, I mean, the th there are two things that I'm much most concerned about. If I had to uh, look at two numbers, one is uh, weekly jobless claims because I thought it was a really good number yesterday, uh, and I suspect that that number was largely a uh, a number based upon Thanksgiving and that, you know, the next number is not going to be as good. It's going to be bad. Uh, it's going to be m more bad than people expect it to be. So in the 800s of thousands of people uh, who are filing initial jobless claims, I also am looking at the hospitalization rate because I believe that hospitalizations are the trigger for shutdowns. Uh, you know, I'm looking at them nationally but it's actually uh, by state and a municipality that it, in, in, it's important. So, you know, California did their shutdown, their rollbacks in places like Chicago. These things are happening, you know, sometimes in part because of the percentage of people who are testing positive to, for coronavirus. But mostly uh, the biggest trigger, the, the most important trigger is how many people are hospitalized, how overwhelmed is the healthcare system. And that to me is something to watch because that's going to have a direct impact on shutdowns and therefore on the economy. Yeah. You know, we haven't talked about COVID yet, but obviously, and it's interesting to see how this uh, this topic is it, it, a sense of people getting inured to it. It just it doesn't seem to be having the impact uh, that maybe it should on us psychologically. I think we can pull up the chart here. U.S. currently hospitalized with COVID. This is from the COVID tracking project from the Atlantic. You know, what you see on this chart is very clear. There, there are three peaks. The first two plateau at around 60,000. And now here we are, most recent data point, December 3rd, yesterday, over 100,000. This is something that has, you know, this isn't an artifact 
That is uh, an unmasking effect that comes from additional testing. Uh, this is hospitalization. So this is not something that the count is being distorted on. This is the number of people who are too ill uh, to no longer be in their homes. And it is incredibly, incredibly sobering. Well, you know, uh, two things on that. Uh, one is, is that even though you say that uh, the numbers can't be massaged. Uh, it's it's not because of more testing. I have seen people say, you know, uh, doctors are sending people to the hospital just, uh, you know, they don't want to get sued, that our system is so screwed up uh, that therefore, you know, you can't trust the hospitalization rate, perhaps on in some capacity, those numbers are elevated relative to where they were before. I don't believe that, just to be blunt. I think that that's, that's uh, a red herring. I think that the reality is, is is that people go to the hospital as a last resort and that this is the realest number that we can look at uh, for the COVID crisis. The second yeah. thing I would point out is that when you look at the numbers, I think they were both over 2,800 of deaths in the last two days. The numbers are actually worse than I've been saying that they would be. Uh, you know, I told you about 2,000 deaths by the time we hit Thanksgiving, we got to that 2,200, in fact. And I was saying that we would reach the peak uh, that we had back in April the 15th uh, during this cycle. We're already there. So what it's saying to me is that I am being relatively conservative in terms of the numbers. Things can get a lot worse, and actually they will get a lot worse in terms of those measures. Uh, the, the latest uh, prediction that I have that has not come out is, as I've said, that in two weeks' time, two weeks past uh, Thanksgiving, we'll get to 110,000 uh, hospitalizations. So that's the next number to look at. If by, let's say, you know, uh, the 12th of December, uh, we're lower than that, then we can be good. But if we're higher than 110,000 by December the 12th, then you can say that I have been, again, conservative. That gives you a sense of how much worse this crisis is than, than, than I'm saying, and that we should be prepared for some serious shutdowns as a result of that. Well, you know, I think, I think that's exactly right. And I, I've been skeptical myself of the case count numbers because I think there is distortion, an artifact that comes from an unmasking effect from more testing. But look, it's very difficult for me to believe. I, I completely agree with you uh, that you have doctors that are sending people to the hospital for for spurious reasons. I, I have a number of friends who are physicians. I see the things that they're posting on Facebook. It's really hard for me to believe that uh, that these folks who really are the frontline soldiers in this war, who are the heroes of this crisis, it's really hard for me to believe that they would be sending people to hospitals who didn't need to be there. They, uh, healthcare workers, doctors especially, understand the risks better than anyone. Uh, of a healthcare system that's overwhelmed, and I just can't believe that they're sending people to the hospital, uh, you know, for political reasons or uh, for some uh, insurance phobia. Uh, they're doing that because people are sick and they need to be uh, assisted in order to regain their health. And, and you know, Ash, actually, it's just the opposite from what I've uh, uh, read. Anecdotally, I understand that because the systems are overwhelmed, yeah. the people who should be in the hospital. They're saying, don't go to the hospital, just call us, you know, alert us as soon as uh, there's any escalation in your case. We're, you, you're on our list of the next uh, most important people. We can't serve you in the hospital now, but alert us. We will get you services as soon as you escalate. To me, that's, uh, that's emblematic of a system that is on the point of overload. That's what's, that's what's occurring right now. So it's the, exactly the opposite of what these people are saying. Yeah, of course. I think that's, of course, correct. So uh, those are the numbers that I'm looking at. Uh, fingers crossed that I'm wrong, that uh, you know hospitalizations aren't above 110,000 by December the 12th, uh, and that uh, you know the, the, the crisis abates somewhat. But uh, you know, I don't think I'm going to be wrong. I would never be happier to be wrong than right now. And with that, Ash, I think that, uh, or should I say, uh, Cash Pennington, we're done for the day. Yes, and done for the week. Good to talk to you. Have a good weekend, everyone.